It's that time again. It's time to look at a Fleet Air Arm Squadron history. And today we have something which is very special to my heart. Now I have to admit, this is actually being recorded on the 18th of March. This is being recorded on the 18th because I have time on the 18th to record it. So that's when it's being recorded. It's the joys of life. And, well, it's being recorded for about the third time. And it's a cool squadron. It really is. It's a cool squadron. It's a squadron which I have a lot of affection for and even a bit of history with myself because I did work experience with them many, many years ago, many, many moons ago when I was a much younger lad than I am now. Ah, a much broader lad, yes. Um, I did work experience with 824 Squadron. And they were a wonderful unit. They really were a lot of fun. They're now based at Cold Rose. And they are currently the training squadron for anti-submarine warfare to train Merlin crews. That's pilots, observers, air crew, all of them. And they're also the fitters and the personnel who maintain the aircraft. Up to standard before they get sent off to the Lion Squadrons. So that's 814 and 820. So, pretty much all of the Royal Navy's Merlin crews, who are not the commando force, go through sometime with 824. More importantly than that, they're also the wartime expansion reserve, in that if suddenly the Royal Navy found itself in a situation where it really needs more Merlins at the front, uh, 824 Squadron is the squadron which is expected to provide them, whilst also carrying on being part of the training pipeline. So they are a really, really cool unit. They also have a very, very cool history. They have been equipped with fairy seals, swordfish, barracudas, fireflies, and gannets. They've had it all. They quite literally have had it all. And it was an interesting time for me to put this slightly set of slides together because they are quite such an experienced unit. They've also been involved in things like Taranto, <laughs> they've been involved in the Falklands War, they've been involved in the creation of Airborne Early Warning, and they're also in at the forefront of helicopter anti-submarine warfare development. It's really weird to think of one squadron being involved in so many things throughout its history. And to evolve quite as much as it has done. It's gone from multi-seat to single seat to multi-seat to helicopters all sorts of places it has gone with its aircraft and its development and its operations and sometimes that's changed in a day I mean one of the things I'm really am happy about is once again I do have my copy of Sturvent with me and 824 Squadron is only a small part in this in this book it's only a small squad part it's uh, you know it's uh one squadron, and it's enough pieces of paper, enough thickness, that you can actually make it out with the camera, without the camera being on high-definition mode. Uh, or rather, well, it is on high-definition, but you can, you know what I mean. Super zoomed in to go, yes! It's not like I'm going, yeah, you know what? This little sprig, this is the squadron history. No. Uh, it's this. <laughs> it's quite a substantial chunk of paper. It's the opposite of poor 823 Squadron, which is literally, is literally that. Sorry, 823. An 824 Squadron has a history really like no other squadron. And that's a good thing. Good thing for me as a historian to talk it through. But it also means it's uh, approaching it when you're doing the year of the aircraft carrier and you don't want to do too many spoilers this early in the year. Does make you think, why did I pick this squadron for the 19th of March? And then I remembered. I liked it. I did work experience with it. And this week's always a special week for me. So I wanted to do it as a treat to myself. A treat which turned into a challenge. Do you sometimes wonder if I don't like myself that much and I don't realise it? I, I do sometimes wonder that. But that's leaving that to one side. Let's get on with this. Now, 
For those who don't know, there is a competition still live till 27th of March, where two copies of this are up for grabs for the, for, uh, the top two. It's a writing competition. There is a link to a video down below which explains everything. It's a really cool competition. And of course, this is Tribal Spinals and Daring's, which is my currently only book out. And of course, the Shaman's Book Plug. If you are really interested in World War II and you want to understand about how destroyers developed through the war, well, these are three classes of large fleet destroyer which the Royal Navy were developing for the general purpose duties. They were built, the first destroyers to be built around the gun armament more than their torpedo armament. And this makes them really special and really forerunners of the modern general purpose destroyer because they're not built around torpedoes. They're built around a whole myriad of missions. Not the attack mission with torpedoes, the do you have to do the cruising presence mission? Do you have to do scouting mission? Do you have to destroy other destroyers? Do you have to attack ships with your torpedoes? All those things are built into these ships. And it's a really interesting look, I, I even if I do so myself, into the discussions and developments that went hand in hand in that development. So, let's consider their battle honours. And it's worthwhile noting that I could find, quite easily online, their modern squadron insignia. I could find this lovely squadron insignia, but their older squadron insignia, which is this eagle carrying a torpedo and sort of reminiscent of certain American squadrons, and rather appropriate, you might notice the water is not quite level, it's, you know, it's at an angle. Yeah, that's rather appropriate for where they started their career, so I, I have a feeling North Sea felt it was a bit like that occasionally. But... Yeah, that, this is their original squadron, squadron emblem, and this is what it is today, how it's evolved. Uh, it evolved from being an eagle carrying a torpedo over rough water to, well, a great white heron, which in heraldic language, and I did check this before saying this because I saw in my notes and went, I'm going to double check that, flying towards the sinister proper. I do love heraldic phraseology. The motto of the unit, Spectact Ubique Spiritus. The wind everywhere looks on. Yes, yes, they, they, they do specialize in scaring the bejesus out of people, especially submarines more recently. Um, they, they are very good at submarines going, what the frigate? Is oh, it's 824. Hang on. I've seen one of A24. That's not a good idea. I've seen one. I didn't see the other two, did I? We're dead in this exercise. They can literally make their Merlins dance, and they do. I have a lot of pride, having done work experience with that unit, and I have a lot of love for them, as they are based in Calderas. Which is RNAS Calderos, aka HMS Seahawk, which is the Cornish Naval Air Station. And it's a rather lovely place to go, although I am still annoyed to this very day that they closed down the viewing station, which used to have a lovely cafe and a little shop. I realize the Fleet Aeron Museum, which ran it, it was not creating a profit most of the year because that's not the way the Cornish economy works. The only thing that really provides large scale employment. During out of out of um, out of season, out of the tourist season, is either fishing. Who again, fishermen don't tend to want to uh, go and um, spend money in little shops. Uh, not uh, not just viewing airplanes and farming, and of course, the largest single employer, the base itself. But that doesn't mean they should have shut it down. You know, there's nothing wrong with running a little shop at a loss. Especially if it has great cake and I get to sit there and watch aircraft. But it's gone. Their battle honours. Calabria, Mediterranean, Taranto, Libya, Malta Convoys, Arctic, and the Falkland Islands. And there probably should be a few more added on there, but they haven't yet been defined as battle honours. That is another joy with battle honours. Because battle honours first has to be defined as this is worthy of an honour. And then the unit's involvement have to be assessed and they have to decide who gets the honour. If you've ever looked at the British in the Second World War and the First World War, there's a very 
uh, heavy Eurocentrism in terms of what counts as battle honours, still to this day. And the bar for un even units which have got that honour for outside European theatre and outside sort of the Mediterranean and that, that sort of area uh, have got a have got something for that. The bar for them getting it seems to be that much higher. And they also seem to be that much larger in terms of the campaigns. It's more a case of it's a more generic phraseology. Like here you've got the Mediterranean and the Malta convoys and the Arctic. Taranto, Libya, Calabria, they're all slightly more specific. Again, this is a trend in a lot of battle honours, but it's something worth picking up on. It's something which... It's not wrong, but it doesn't really feel right either. I hope that doesn't seem strange to say, but it, it, there's the case. And this is the insignia you will see today. So, they started off with a Ferry 3F when they formed in 1933. And as said, they would operate some rather interesting aircraft in their history. The Seal, the Swordfish, both Mark I and Mark II. The Sea Hurricane 2C, the Wildcat 5, the Barracuda 2, the Firefly FE, FR1 and Firefly AS6. The Avenger uh, in a couple of different forms as well. The Gannet in about <laughs> three forms. The Whirlwind and the Sea King in at least four forms, possibly more, or quite probably more. And because that just comes from this book, and this book ends in 1983, and believe it or not, the squadron continued on serving. In fact, the squadron served on until about 1989, and then was reformed in 2000, 2001. Uh, technically, it's it, it's equipped with eight Augusta Merlin, uh, Merlin uh, helicopters in 2000, but they get actually sort of work it takes them a few months to work up to being full status so they get their helicopters they get their crew it takes a while for a unit to actually gel together and be fully formed and fully put together um so there's a bit of a debate there and yeah they've they've been working at it ever since so they've been going now 23 years nearly nearly you can argue soon 24 but They're a good unit, and they have, as I said, a few years ago, they had me as a work experience, because that's something you can do in the UK if you're interested in it. If you're a GCC student in the UK, you tend to go for work experience in companies, and the Royal Navy is very happy to take people for work experience. Hence, I did my work experience a week at Colrose uh, with 824, and a week at Yeovilton with 848 Squadron, which I loved. I had a great time. Came back, discussed with all my friends, work experience, and they're going, yeah, I worked in an office, I did this, I did that, and I went, yeah, I, I spent a week on heli, two weeks on helicopters. One week pinging away, and also managed to get up in the AEW, in the AEW Squadron 849 as well. And um, one week... Jumping out on Dartmoor, pretty much. From jungly helicopters. <laughs> yeah. Most of my colleagues were not very happy with me. But as said, their initial beginnings were the Ferry 3F. Uh, spotter, reconnaissance aircraft, that was fairly common for the Royal Navy in this period and was pretty much a direct evolution of an aircraft which had been providing the Royal Navy service during World War One and onwards. The Fairy Free just keeps being iterated on, iterated on, and iterated on. And it's part of the design evolution which eventually leads to the Swordfish. I have discussed this before with the Swordfish, but when we start discussing it, uh, you always have to remember that every generation of aircraft in between has pretty much been an iteration on the previous one. So by the time you get to the Swordfish, it's no wonder you have a very reliable, very solid design, because basically they've just been constantly improving 
upon what was the version beforehand. They haven't tried to make any great strategic leaps, any great, you know, bounds into the unknown. No, they're trying to make the most reliable, viable aircraft they can for long-range night strikes using the technology they have available at the time and their understanding the situation time. Now, this tends to get me into a comment conversation with people because there are people who go, well, no, a biplane's not more reliable and this and that and it. And I go, you have to remember the perception at the time in the 20s and 30s. The perception at the time was it was more reliable. And yes, you can point to an individual. That's lovely. But you're having to talk about the entire air ministry, the entire aircraft industry. And whilst there are going to be individuals who are outliers or free thinkers or savants or whatever you want to call them, the trouble is, whilst you can always point to the ones who got it right, there are also usually, for every one who gets it right, there's about three or four who were just as loud who are completely wrong. And if you're an organisation like the Admiralty or the Air Ministry, if you pick the wrong one of those savants, which, let's be honest, you've got a roughly 75-80% chance of doing and bet the house on it, well, you could have just lost the war. So do you take that bet, or do you wait for a bit more information to play, come out and play it safe? You play it safe. Because safe isn't going to lose your war. It might not win your war, but it's not going to lose your war. Whereas gambling might lose your war. Yes, it might win the war. But remember that scenario? There's a 75-80% chance that you've got one of the ones... That the person who's most persuasive of you is the one who's wrong. And before we get into it, they did, manage, they did still put some money on some savants. And honestly, the air ministry proved very bad at picking them. The Admiralty, slightly more lucky... But when we say slightly more lucky, the Admiralty actually put money behind more of them. And whereas the REF proved about 20% successful, the Royal Navy proved about 22% successful. Once you go over it. And don't get me started in the army. They were the worst. They're, they're, of their savants they picked, I literally it goes down to about 10% turned out to be right. And it turns out some of the savants they really, really persecuted and pushed out of the arm, pushed out of the army, were right as well. So, uh, yeah, th this is the other trouble with governments trying to pick on who they think is. They sometimes will end up going with a person who's the best communicator in phraseology they understand, accept, and that might not mean actually the person who's right. So, yeah, in the end, it's better to play it safe and just let the information come out and then see where the information goes. Broadly speaking. Their next aircraft was the Fairy Seal. That's a cool aircraft. It's an improvement of the Fairy Free. Basically, it is the Fairy Free with a new engine and slightly changed airframe design. But it works. And again, it's spotter reconnaissance. It's about providing information. It's about anti-submarine warfare. It's about doing what the Royal Navy needs from its aircraft most of all. Information. Information. Find the enemy. Tell us where they are. Attack them, delay them if you can, but allow us to find them and take them out. And these are some of the vessels that a squadron served from over the years. Eagle, Hermes, Illustrious, Argus, Activity, Unicorn, Striker, Theseus, Bulwark, Ark Royal, Albion, Victorious, Hermes, Centra Centaur, Engadine, Almeida, Ulna, Fort Grange, Tidepool, Fort Austin, Alwyn, Illustrious, and Invincible, plus Ark Royal, plus... I think I would be surprised if they had some time on the current aircraft carriers and some of the RFAs. And by the way, that, again, stats come from this book. And for them to count as a major squadron deployment, you're talking at least two-thirds of the aircraft have to be employed. And those are different Hermeses and different Illustrious and... Also, those aren't individual deployments. They might do several turns on that ship, or they might inter alternate between two of them. Or it, it, it's fun. It, it's a fun history. It's a fun history of thirty of fifty years of service. 
and you can see how they evolve and their role changes. But also you can see where you're starting to get your information from. The moment they start deploying on the R the, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary Vessels, why are you putting helicopters on them? Well, they're useful for anti-submarine warfare. It also expands the capabilities of a task force they're with, because if you've got the anti-submarine warfare helicopters operating from the fleet auxiliaries, then they can operate from them, a nice, very large, in comparison, flight deck, and slightly larger, more stable hull, usually, than your frigates and destroyers, so slightly better operating characteristics, and you don't have to interfere with the operations of the aircraft carrier. This is something to think about when we're talking about operations. So often we shrink down operations to what can you get from this hull. Again, it's the aggregate of the task force. A fleet auxiliary loaded with three to four of the helicopters, well, that becomes a very useful anti-submarine warfare platform. No, it can't coordinate the anti-submarine warfare operations. That usually will be put to a frigate. But those extra four helicopters can be operated from that fleet auxiliary very well, thank you very much. And also, those helicopters can also do double duty. They can be used to move supplies around the task force when it needs to be moved. Now, the main problem comes when you have to send that fleet auxiliary to go get resupplied, to resupply your task force. What do you do with the helicopters? Do you let them go with the auxiliary? That's going to provide the auxiliary with extra security as it's moving and help it and make it maybe make it safer as it's going out and coming back. And it's probably got to take a frigate with it as well for extra protection. But that also means then you're losing a frigate with its helicopter and four more helicopters, three or four more helicopters. And that's suddenly a big chunk of your force. And that suddenly becomes a very big decision of when to send a vessel for resupply. So, yeah, it's useful, but it does make life more complicated. That's the tradition, though, with warfare. New technology does not make warfare easier. It makes it more complicated every single time. And, of course, most famously, the fairy swordfish. This is a Mark I, which served April 1937 to August 1942 and October 1942 to January 1943. And the Mark II, of course, served November 1942 to October 1944. This is the aircraft which probably 824 are most synonymous with, because it's this aircraft they carry out the Taranto strike with. Two of their aircraft get transferred from HMS Eagle to HMS Illustrious to make up for losses Illustrious has had due to a hangar fire. I know, this is terrible for me to say, but yes, carriers have fires. I know there's been recent reporting about HMS Queen Elizabeth having a fire, and if you read some of the newspapers, and this is taking place in... March 2024, if you read some of the newspapers, you'd believe a carrier never had a fire before, and it's a huge national tragedy. Well, I'm sorry to inform you, but A, fires happen on ships. They are a lot. Of, there's a lot of chemicals and a lot of very complicated stuff, uh, complicated components working on them, and things can go wrong in those scenarios, and a lot of very flammable materials as well being worked, on, worked around for obvious reasons. But more importantly... You have a lots of bits of machinery moving around and lots of people moving around. And people are human. And humans, no matter how well trained they can be, can still make mistakes. And that mistake can be as much as they just put X next to Y quickly while they're sorting out D. And then they get the side they have to go off and deal with F and G. And then someone just bumps into X, and it hits Y, and oh frigate. Luckily, the more recent fire didn't manage to destroy free aircraft. That happened to Illustrious. That was fine. They put some air, they got some aircraft from Eagle, and Eagle, of course, at that time, had some issues herself. She, her, due to bomb damage, her fuel management system wasn't working. That's annoying. I mean, she's not viable. She's fixed up and then going off and doing more strikes very shortly afterwards. It's really annoying. It's literally very short period either side of Taranto. She's not viable, uh, viable operationally. 
But they have to go and do Taranto when they do, because the Italian fleet is where it is, and it's the right night conditions. There is the right kind of moon for long-range navigation, for accurate long-range navigation. It's the right kind of stars, it's the right kind of clear, you can see the stars clearly, their position, uh, you know, everything works according to the charts, it's clouds sorted out, it's all perfect weather conditions. But Eagle's not available. You move any of those those moving objects just a tad. Any of those things, those scenarios change out just a little bit. Eagle's available. You have the whole of 824 Squadron involved in the attack on Toronto. You have all the aircraft that have been available from Illustrious and probably any other swordfish the Royal Navy could have scraped up. Because even before they were moving 824 and a couple of, uh, a couple of aircraft from there to join Illustrious, they were wandering around the various airfields going, have we got anything in container form or actually assembled? They wanted aircraft. They wanted to take the maximum strike load they could with them. A24 was a good squadron to have them. To illustrate how quickly Eagle's back in operation, later in November, this is just the same month as Taranto, 824 squadron operating from Eagle attacked the docks at Tripoli. They take part and they carry out an attack on the docks in Tripoli. And they carry on having all sorts of interesting and fun times. At one point, they, um, 3rd of April 1941, they attack enemy destroyers off Massawa in Eritrea. Two of those destroyers were sunk and two were driven ashore. Mm, destroyers is being a bit nice to them. They're the typical Italian boats. Uh, then they re-embarked to sail around the Cape for the South Africa uh, and the South Atlantic to help search uh, for the German battleship Bismarck. Eagle was out searching, just making sure she didn't go south. And while they are doing that, they managed to find the U-boat supply ship, the Elba, and su successfully bombed it in mid-Atlantic. And then nine days later, and this is nine days later, is the 15th of June, they found the German tanker, the Lothrigan, and they forced it to surrender with aircraft alone. That's operating from HMS Eagle. Flying swordfish. Yes, swordfish can force a ship to commit uh, to surrender. That's when I'd consider it sensible. <laughs> You'd be looking at them going, Look, on paper, I can shoot them down. On paper. In reality, I'm just not sure. I'm just, it, it's just, it's reached the level of, it's kind of like the A-10 Warthog. It's reached that level of, on paper, we can shoot this down. In reality, we prefer not to roll that dice because they have a nasty habit of coming up ones for us and six for them. We just do. And the squadron basically carries on doing these kind of operations. They take part in and strikes off Norway. They take part in various bomber reconnaissance missions. They turn up and do operations in the Far East. They are wandering around the world doing whatever's required of them whenever it's required of them. And they really do operate a wide variety of aircraft. Whilst they're operating from the strike carriers, what they're often doing is operating as a multi-flight, multi multi-aircraft squadron where they'd have two to three flights of swordfish or equivalent or replacement equivalent aircraft and a flight of fighters. And so they would be the entire squadron, the entire air group, operating from that strike carrier. They would provide all its aircraft. It's a very simple command structure-wise way to actually operate, and it's quite common for the Royal Navy to do this during the Second World War. 824 Squadron becomes... Pretty experienced at it, and they're going to do it again multiple times in their history. In fact, they transition while still operating swordfish from hurricanes to grown wildcats. You know, you might as well. A useful aircraft, and you're changing from one thing, a one little, a one fighter to another fighter. 
it does create an interesting interplay in the squadron because quite a lot of the pilots decided to dual certify themselves. So they would be swordfish pilots in one flight, but they would also go and decide to go and fly the Wildcats occasionally, so that got extra people qualified with the Wildcats or the Hurricanes. And again, it happened the same way with the Hurricane and sort of the Martlet pilots, aka Wildcat pilots. You know, they they go off and they do the the training and the cross training with the other units. And this is another reason how they kept their night flying capabilities as good as they could, because it was far more common for night flying for pilots to go off for night flying aircraft, for aircraft doing patrols at night, to be the multi seat planes, the multi seat aircraft. Please note. Smaller side. I keep seeing this word aircrafts appear online lately. That doesn't exist. Okay. Aircrafts is you, I don't know, make doing basket weaving while in the air. Aircraft, you can have one aircraft or ten aircraft or twenty aircraft. There is no S required. It's a small bugbear of mine, but it keeps turning up online, and I just like it to stop. I realise there are people for whom English is their second, third or fourth language and it might seem strange to them that a plural doesn't have an S after it automatically. And I agree, but the same thing comes with all forms of craft and watercraft, etc. Because of the FT and the way that that's sort of phrased, instead sort of the craft scenario, they don't have the S. There is all sorts of weird rules around it, but basically it's just easier to just go... It's a no. There can be a dozen airplanes, or a dozen planes, but there will always only be a dozen aircraft. So, just a, just a small bug there. And, really, this squadron just keeps going from strength to strength. They keep operating more and more aircraft throughout the war. They keep doing more and more operations and complex operations throughout the war. They are fundamentally very useful. At a certain point they do start to replace their swordfish with barracuda. Well, that's a nice replacement to have. Okay, the barracuda has many bad points and many good points, but the thing is, it's delayed it's supposed to be if the Royal Navy had had their way things are going according, according to plan. You would have had the Firefly, the Barracuda. You would have had probably, I, I'm fairly certain, uh, uh, the Gullwing sort of Spitfire kind of aircraft known as the Super, uh, which would have been known as the Supermarine Seafire. And that name was locked off a lot earlier than the Spitfire was. In some, uh, according to some accounts. Other accounts put the Spitfire being lo uh, locked off earlier as a name allocated to a Supermarine. And that would have been your core air groups. If war had held off post-1942. That's what the Royal Navy would have been building their air groups around. And probably some kind of successor to the Skewer as a dive bomber. You would have had the long-range reconnaissance fighter. You would have had the air defense fighter. Or closer to an interceptor. You would have had the long-range strike reconnaissance aircraft. And you would have had the bombing reconnaissance aircraft. Now, remember, the Firefly, the Fulmar, they both have a technical bombing capability. So, theoretically, the Fulmar is actually built from an aircraft which was designed to be a dive bomber. Theoretically, the RRN maintains quite a lot of dive-certified aircraft. You want to be really scared, there's the reality that the uh, lovely Swordfish was dive-certified, to an extent. The Royal Navy didn't use it in its dive bombing form that often. When it did, it did turn out that the Swordfish's abilities with its forms of balance and its ability to the aircraft did mean it could actually almost hold the vertical above targets. The aircraft is practically a, a helicopter. But the Fairy Barracuda... It's good aircraft. 
okay, it's not the best aircraft when it comes into service because it's been mucked around so many times during the war, during its development cycle. It's changed engines, oh goodness knows how many times, because people always focus in and just go, well, it's changing engine for this na from this named engine to this named engine, and that is a change, I do agree, but also changing between the individual marks of engines. Just because it has the same name doesn't make it necessarily the same shape or the same weight-bearing points on the airframe. Sometimes they change within engine uh, engine developments. Just to cause you more stress, and that does happen, and you change propeller types, and you're trying to create a very advanced aircraft. The Barracuda was the British attempting to leapfrog and make a very advanced aircraft. That's one reason why they procured the Albacore, to provide them with cover until the Barracuda's ready. Basically, it's, uh, we're making this great leap into the unknown. What happens if war comes earlier than 1942? We'd better have something as a stopgap. An interim. And all these decisions are taken before war begins. So what you are dealing with in a large section of World War II for the Royal Navy. And they're not using aircraft which they were aiming to use. They're using aircraft they accepted as interim aircraft. That were supposed to buy them time and give them coverage. If the worst case scenario bro happened and war broke out before their desired aircraft were ready. Squadrons like 824 get to operate a lot of them. In fact, after that, come the Fireflies. Which actually fit with the Barracudas. Let's be honest, having, an, uh, having a squadron made up of Fireflies and Barracudas... Makes sense. By about this point, though, they had started to simplify things, to pare down. And so you actually do find it more a case of they start off with Barracudas and then they transfer over to fully Fireflies. The Firefly is a very good aircraft for the Royal Navy. It's a very good, heavy, I would call it tactical aircraft. It's able to do anti-submarine operations, it's able to do strikes of rockets, it's got air defense capabilities. It's very rugged. It has a career mainly because the career it has mainly because it's so adaptable. Some people go, well, it's an improved full might. It's not. It was actually in development. It comes from a common ancestor. But they're not descendants. It's more they're more a case of Well that would have made them siblings if they were defended from both P four thirty slash thirty four. Um but they're not. They're descended from, uh, this one's descended from the earlier designs which are about nineteen thirty and earlier developments. So I think that makes them cousins? There's a strong family resemblance, but that's been due in many ways to mission, role, and the technologies at the time that were used in the development. But they're not the same. And again, you have the FR variant versus the AS variant, and the different roles that gives you. And for these versions, the FR, of course, is the fighter reconnaissance. It's the original version. It's the version we all really imagine when we talk about the Firefly. AS-6 is important because the AS-5 was the first anti-submarine sort of version that really worked and wasn't an experimental model, but that had been fitted with American Sonar Boys and American sourced equipment. The AS-6, that's fitted with British equipment. And again, there's an interesting discussion about that, and it's sort of some people sometimes go, "Well, this shows Britain couldn't develop it." Britain was having a real trouble at the end of World War Two. There is a real problem because of the way lend-lease ends. During the war, British economy gets structured around lend-lease. Does because that's part of what's going on, and everything is structured around it. And then, without any warning. When the British had been under the assumption that Lend-Lease was going to be something which was going to be phased out over six to eight months. It was instead phased out 
instantly, overnight. And there was no warning given to the Allies. This caused a lot of economic trouble and caused a lot of disruption in development and prioritization of what we're spending on while we sort out the mess. Because you can imagine, it would be like... How do I put this? If you're back, not just your employer, not really your employer, but your entire bank account and banking system was shut down without any notice. And you have to struggle to reassess that and re-implement it. But it's on a nation scale. Because during the war, the banking system that had been set up had been lend lease. And yes, the British owed money and there was debt. But the British had also been lending equipment to the Americans. And by the way, it also caused some very funny things for the Americans. Because they also didn't tell some of their units which were using British equipment. Which they got under lend lease. And they suddenly found they had to return that. And there was a fair number of American commanders who had were going, well, hang on, we're still using this equipment. We're still using these things. It's there are there are books you read which you call it a huge outrage of Britain and all these things. It is, but it's mostly an unthinking problem, and the fact that it causes problems for the Americans as well as shows just how small a group. We're going, well, the war is over, so we end this system right now. Without talking to anyone. And out really, without thinking it through. And without really, realize, without really realizing the consequences. It's really quite hilarious. When you're far enough away, you can look back at it and go, Oh, good lord, they shot themselves royal in the foot. And it actually, very quickly, uh, one of the reasons why it gets sorted out as quick as it does is because... Someone in America then turns around and goes, hang on, what happens if we've caused such a big shock to the British economy, which has just come out of years of war, etc., and this? They fall to communism. <sighs> but then the British don't get included in the Marshall Plan. And so the Americans have to come with something different, which is almost best spoke for working with the British economy. And the British, by that point, are annoyed. And it's a it's a really fun piece of how not to run a country. It's also a good lesson for all of us today who like to believe that our governments today are the most inept they ever have been and that there was some shining time where they were brilliant. No. Governments have always had issues. They are usually competent in some areas. They are usually areas they have to be for periods when they have to be, they have to learn to be competent, and they are going to make mistakes in others. And the thing is, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. And the really bad thing about democracy, the thing that really causes the most trouble, especially today with 24-hour media and social media and things constantly being appearing online within five seconds with no context and no nuance, is that you have to see how the sausage is made. And it destroys the illusion that the butchers making the sausage really do know what they're doing, rather than are just trying their best or making it up as they go along or being asleep at the wheel. But no. So you have... The anti uh, the anti summary Mark Six, and that's another good looking aircraft. But again, it's a bit of an interim aircraft. It really is a bit of an interim aircraft. Why do I say that? Because there are other aircraft around. There is the Grumman Avenger, which you might look at and go, "Hang on, Alex, that's nineteen fifty three to fifty four, and nineteen fifty four to fifty five, which means they're operating that almost simultaneously." With that one, and uh, isn't this after then lease? Haven't they passed these aircraft back? Well, again, some of the fun thing with the the Avenger aircraft is they keep going backwards and forwards. Because again, you find yourself very quickly getting into the Cold War period, and very quickly America goes, "Hang on, we want allies. Otherwise, we've got to do it all ourselves." 
and the British going, yeah, so we'd like to buy some equipment back. Mainly because we're still producing, uh, producing what will be the British aircraft, which comes in, which is this... Oh, let's be honest, the Ferry Gunner is a very special, special aircraft. There are very few aircraft which, when they have been intercepted by American interceptor aircraft over the continental United States, having caused the pilot to respond, I think I found God. And, to be fair, the pilot on that occasion was, quite literally, smoking a pipe, reading a book, flying the aircraft, and not bothered at all by the fully armed, very ups, uh, very worried about what's entering the American airspace, Interceptor, which is pulling up next to him. Apparently he waved at one point and just went, hello, and then carried on reading. That wasn't 824 Squadron, but <laughs> it, was AW, it was airborne early warning versions of the Gannets. Oh, but no, the Gannet comes into service, and that's the British real sort of long-range anti-submarine warfare aircraft. And this is a period when we're talking about, and it's something that was lost from the world when you lot, when the Viking was deactivated from the American carriers, but the long-range anti-submarine warfare patrol, the aircraft being able to be thrown out a great distance from the carrier. So you had helicopters providing the short to medium range air airborne anti-submarine warfare and vikings or gannets in this period or prior to that in the british service avengers and prior to that fireflies providing the medium to long range air studies re reconnaissance and search and that was more important in a way when you were dealing with vessels which were still surfacing snorkeling etc in order to get keep themselves operating, operate, you know, be able to operate underwater, be able to achieve their high speeds. Nuclear submarines can, of course, stay deeper for longer and then pop up, and then that's dependent on access to the outside world for their operations. But still, long range does help. There is an argument people often put out, and going, well, if they're... Um, Magnetic anomaly detector doesn't pick anything up and they are not therefore don't drop any sonar boys in the right space They'll never detect the submarine. So, you know, they're, they're just an out. They're just a thing you don't ha That's sort of out there and not really doing a kill Well again people forget it's the same thing They forget when they're talking about air defense of carriers and avi air groups and during World War two we talk about the fighters breaking up strikes so that that makes them more manageable, so they come in dribs and drabs. Rather than a concentrated wave, they are broken up. And it doesn't so matter so much matter if the zoom and boom, and that's what we tend to call them, because the what would happen is the, and I'll do a whole video about this, the radar controllers would organize the pilots to be up to a certain, would take the cap at a certain altitude, go, that's the direction the enemy are, Zoom down. They're going to be at this altitude. Make sure you're at a high enough altitude. Especially if you're already high up. You can get a bit higher up a little bit e quite enough easily. And then zoom down using your speed to break up by just basically blasting through. All guns blazing, blasting through the enemy formation. And break them up. And if you take out an enemy aircraft, great. If you don't, doesn't matter. What matters is you've broken up the, uh, the formation. Well, it's kind of the same with long-range carrier-based anti submarine warfare. You're about breaking up packs. You're about breaking up attacks. About making it so that they don't want to proceed in a group. So that they want to keep disparate. And yeah, if you find something, great. If you don't, if you've met the fact that the submarines will have to think about you and will have to factor you into their operations can often be enough of an impact in the first place. You're, this is the trouble when we're talking about a deterrence asset. People think of deterrence as a conflict management peacetime scenario only. It's not. Deterrence is also a factor when we're talking about ongoing active operations. If you know the enemy has X and Y capabilities, you will design, you will adapt your force around them, which will narrow down your options and avenues of attack. 
and that's what these aircraft really did provide. But they were soon to move to helicopters and they get the western whirlwind and come on. There is something about the western whirlwind which does look cute. And they have an interesting history of them, they really do. They would operate these aircraft in exercises and on... Not exercises. In the Arctic, North Atlantic of course, but also in the Mediterranean, the Middle East, the Indian Ocean and the Far East. They would take them all around the world. And they were pretty happy with them. They were pretty useful. And they did develop quite a good experience in terms of reputation of operating them. But honestly, what were they? Preparation for when they started operating these. And... Goodness me. They get up to something with these. They even re-embrace their multi-aircraft operating scenario where they have D-Flight as the first of the airborne early warning flights. And they really do a good job. So good, they are sent off to Form 849 Squadron. Rather than being 824. They go, well, actually, no. These are so good, we want them as part of their own squadron. And I have thought about that as being an interesting thing of if we carried on the tradition of doing this sort of multi-aircraft squadrons of aircraft having multiple roles, maybe we've ended up going down the role of having a multi-role helicopter frame where which you could slot in and chain transition with, you know, just add in a container or something into the back of, especially you could do that with the Merlin actually, in the way it's structured. You could have the airborne early warning system goes in and this radar and its operating systems go in on sort of a container payload straight in or it could be configured to commando or transport or anti-submarine warfare. But no, we went down a specialist, a specialist squadron route and realistically the world and its technology wasn't ready for that in 1982, uh, 1984 when they made the decision. It wasn't. This squadron had a lot to do with all those developments. This squadron during the Falklands War is one of those critical squadrons providing support from various Royal Fleet Auxiliaries. Again, we talk about how we max out the Sea Harriers on Invincible, on Ark Roy <coughs> on Invincible and Hermes and Illustrious when she goes down. We do. And later on on the little Ark, Ark Royal. But one of the ways we max out the Sea Harriers and the Harriers being aboard those carriers is the Sea Kings. The anti-submarine warfare helicopters, they're operating from the fleet auxiliaries. So rather than thinking of the carriers as this all-in-one platform, you have to think of them as a hub of multiple platforms. Coordinating the service, maintenance, stores and supplies across multiple vessels. With some uh, with frigates taking lead for certain sectors in terms of anti-submarine warfare, coordinating aircraft, which could be their own aircraft, it could be aircraft coming from a carrier, it could be aircraft coming from a fleet auxiliary, it could be those aircraft could be coming from anywhere. They're being flown up, launched, and they go into a basket, an operating pool, and are att attached to each area depending on need. And some of them are then detached, and they're going off and providing lift capability and being re-rolled from anti-submarine warfare because it turns out the Argentine submarine force isn't that strong and isn't that present. Life happens. You, you go down there and the Argentines have on paper a very strong submarine force. And then you actually get down there operating and one of their submarines ends up being lost to the Royal Marines. It's always the Marines. They're always doing these random things. It's just why the Royal Navy takes them with them. But the helicopters doing the patrols are going, well, we, we, we're mostly pinging on whales and probably some schools of fish. Okay. Well, we need a lot of logistics moved ashore, especially when we lose the Chinooks. I only get one Chinook of, the, of them sent down there because, of course, the Atlantic conveyor is hit. 
because there isn't an airborne early warning helicopter. If there had been airborne early warning helicopters, the odds of Atlantic Conveyor getting hit or the Royal Navy suffering in any way, shape or form the same level of losses they actually did suffer goes way down every time you run the simulation. Because the Argentines are literally at the end of their range. At the end of their strike and command range and their operational radius of effective operational. And the British would have that much level, a greater level of information received, that much greater level of coverage in terms of radar depth. And it would be that much less likely for the Argentines to actually get close enough. You could have actually even pushed the carriers forward. Had them operating between the Falkland Islands and Argentina. Instead of in pretty much off, uh, mostly keeping to a safe zone, which was the other side of the Falklands from Argentina. Well, no, the Sea Kings, they're useful. They give them real capabilities. And this is a helicopter which, in load, and an operational reliability starts to rival that which had been achieved by fixed-wing aircraft when they'd been operating them. The whirlwind had been good. Sea King was reliable. It really was. And after the Sea King, things only got better. We have the Merlin. Which... Good Lord, it's scary to think about, but is. Pretty much on line for replacement. We're now starting the... Well, it's already probably been on it, going on informally for a while. I know I've had some very interesting conversations where people have talked about what kind of concepts do you think? Informally, of course. It's been interesting. And it is kind of interesting to think about this aircraft because for me... When I was a kid, this was the helicopter entering service. This was the cool new thing. And nothing makes you feel older than when the cool new thing of your childhood is the thing which is now not just the workhorse, but the reliable old workhorse. The vintage, uh, the elder statesman in many regards of the helicopter fleet, especially the Royal Navy's helicopter fleet. Yes, there are other airframes types which have been longer in service. There are, with the, Royal Na with the British forces. But in many ways, the Merlin has been a stalwart. When I first went down to 824 Squadron, one of the things I was introduced to was the concept that they procured it as a stock Merlin. It came in as a stock Merlin. And it came with some great avionics and great systems. But the trouble is those systems didn't mesh with the British systems. So the British would get delivery of the helicopter. Then they would take it to their own factory. Take delivery. Instead of taking to, to operate it, they take it to a factory in the UK would rip out all the electronics and rebuild the electronics. And they did this because of the need to make everything work together as succinctly as possible. And also because at the time, it was felt that was cheaper than trying to pay all the various arms manufacturers to actually build and make their systems talk to each other. And you know what's scary? Because some people say, it, that was, that's a terrible idea, that's a terrible waste of money. It probably still is cheaper. Honestly, looking at some of the ways things have evolved, I could see the next generation of 824 aircraft having to go through a very similar thing. Or perhaps they won't. Perhaps someone will go, no, no, we can't admit this, we can't do this. We have to pretend that they would, that actually these companies will talk to each other, will work together. So we're going to have to pay the money for them to work together. I don't know. I do know they're very, very professional cab drivers. They are very, very professional. Cab being one of the Royal Navy's many slang terms for... Helicopters. 
And the squadron is a regular sight in the air over Cornwall. If you're ever in Cornwall and you see a Merlin buzzing over you, it's probably 824. Yes, it could be the other squadrons, the other, br other uh, sections, but the vast majority of the flights and the flying time, it's going to be 824 buzzing around over your head. And think about them. Think about this is a squadron which has served all around the world for the Royal Navy. This is a squadron which has delivered on operations in the Falklands War, in World War II, in the interwar years against pirates, and all sorts of random different operations. Flying from escort carriers, fleet auxiliaries, fleet carriers, light fleet carriers. They have done everything. And they haven't had a massive fanfare about it. Although they probably deserve one, but there again, there's a dozen other squadrons which have a similar history which deserve one. That's one thing you're always quite lucky of in Britain. If ever you're serving and need some inspiration, more often than not, look at your unit history. Look at what you're named for. Look at what your forebears have done. And that's a good thing. That's a benefit. It really is. Because, and I will state this as many times in as many videos as I can, because it can never be stated enough. A key thing with humans, with our ability to rise to occasions and manage to accomplish great feats, it's self-image. It's part believing ourselves to be capable. And it's part not wanting to let down our wider community that we represent. And a unit history really does give you that opportunity. These are all aircraft which are going to be featured over this year and in the coming years in the key aircraft series. They're all aircraft which I'm going to go into great details of, up to and including the Merlin. Because I love the Merlin. It wasn't the first helicopter I got to uh, work on the Jesus Bolt of. It wasn't the first helicopter I got to take the auxiliary power unit and try and help fix it. But it meant a lot to me. It had lines and it just seemed to have purpose. And all the squadron, they knew what they were doing. They knew what their role was. Their role was to provide the next generation of sub hunters, the next generation of pingers, to go out and help the Royal Navy keep the world a little bit safer, keep British interests a little bit more secure, protect trade routes, protect national resources, protect the nuclear deterrent, all those missions that have to be done 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks of the year. That have to go on whether you're thinking about them or not. And they did it with pride. So, 824 Squadron. I have to say, the only thing that annoyed me, that has ever annoyed me about the unit, and I'm just going to go the very quick route to get to it, is I prefer this badge to that one. <laughs> I can understand PC-wise why they can't. It's not as, it's not as well, modern world friendly. 
but I still prefer it. And I'm so tempted to make today's question, which one do you prefer? I'm not going to. I'm not going to. But no. The thing I'd like you to think about today is to do with the Merlin. I'd like you to think about all those different aircraft they've operated, about the roles this squadron has taken on. It's anti submarine warfare, it's search and rescue, it's presence, it's getting tankers to surrender. And I want you to think, not in terms of naming a specific type of aircraft, because that doesn't help, believe it or not. Not naming a specific aircraft, naming a Merlin or whatever, no. I want you to think about what are the concepts of operations? What are the things and the kind of roles which you think 824's next aircraft is going to have to take on? What do you think their next stallion they will ride into the sky for the Royal Navy will have to do? Because that is how you start the process of deciding upon procurement. You don't start by picking out an aircraft type or thinking, oh, that's a cool, sexy aircraft, I'd like to operate that. You start by thinking, what do we need to do? And then once you know what you need to do, you then decide what best fits what you need to do. Of the aircraft which are projected as coming into service, are maybe in service and going to be upgraded. But the reality is, Unless you can have some very, very discreet briefings, a lot of that information in part, section part two, is not going to be made available to the public. But it is quite easy, from a public perspective, to work out what's in option at section one. And that's what I'd like you to do. And to think about that, that then explains a lot of what happens in terms of procurement. If you think about section one, that will often explain a lot of decisions made in procurement. It will also show you when mistakes are made, because you'll be able to look at your Section 1 and go, have they actually gone the route which fits Section 1? A good example of that is the whole Australian submarine saga. The reality was, the thing that would have best fit Section 1 is if they carried on keeping the Collins class in, co in construction and improvement, and slowly been improving that and producing a sub every 18 or so months and slowly evolving that and then slowly phasing the older subs out of service and keeping a constant group in. And that would have kept skills and capabilities alive and would have made it far more cost effective because you'd have been able to slowly implement things and improve things. But if you don't do that, then look at your criteria. Look at what your Section 1 is and then be honest about what fits Section 1. And the trouble is, the Collins was the last of the generation of long-range, large SSKs. Even the Japanese ones aren't the same capability sphere as the Collins in many regards. Especially not compared to what the Australians really needed. And then we can get talk about aircraft, but we can also talk about the ground vehicles. You can also realise what's maybe been added into Section 1, which shouldn't necessarily have been there. You can argue a lot of decisions made during a certain period of British Ministry of Defence procurement was it had to be anyone else other than BAE they went to. Which meant certain things didn't get a proper look at in comparison to others. So, 824 Squadron. The question today, Section 1. What do you think they're going to have to do? What do you think are they going to do? the missions, the roles, and the scope of those missions and roles? What is their range? What kind of scenario are they looking at? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, next week is going to be conception, operation, and conclusion, uh, uh, conclusion of the Kaiserliche Marines carriers, their seaplane carriers from World War One. They're really rather interesting vessels. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And hope you had a very, very good Tuesday, although I'm recording this on Monday. Take care.